I know most of us are not ready for summer to be over, uh, but it's, it's one of those things where maybe it's like the band-aid, you just rip it off. <laughs> it's over, it's done. The fall has begun. Um, when we turn the page from our quietest month of the year, August, into September, we're looking ahead to the launch of every ministry in uh, the next few weeks. And this is the time of year, along with the new year, January, when we love to share grace stories. For the past 12 years or so, this is the way we've kicked off our new ministry season. Um, Grace Stories is the name we give to these personal testimonies shared by ordinary GRC members. I say ordinary because they're just like you and me. They're ordinary because each of us can relate to something about their struggle, their pain, their doubts, their failures, their weaknesses. At the same time, every story is extraordinary, extraordinary. Not because the people who will stand here and share over these next three Sundays are spiritual giants who are living out their Christian faith better than the rest of us. No, each story is extraordinary because each will highlight the good, the beauty that God is still working even in the midst of struggle and pain. If you're new here at Grace Redeemer Church during this kickoff season, these stories will give you a pretty good sense of who we are, what we're about as a worshiping community, as a spiritual family. This morning, Rob Peck is ready to share his grace story. You may start out smiling. You will probably do some crying. But by the end, our hope is that you will be worshiping, that you will place more so than before, worth where it belongs, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen and eternal. Rob, thank you, Peter. Sorry, this uh, new pair is doing some strange things with my hair. (laughs) (laughs) Um, By the grace of God, I was born into a loving family who followed Jesus. My parents taught me the Bible from a young age. I went through a rebellious period in middle school and high school. Then you, you need encouragement about a, a rebellious teenager. I encourage you to talk to my mother. She'd be happy to talk to you. That's <laughs> more than any child's heart. I came to claim my parents' faith as my own through the faithful ministry of one of our youth leaders. Um, God led me to my Proverbs 31 woman during my freshman year of college at Covenant. This is God who wanted us to wait until we graduated, so we got married a week after graduation. <laughs> um, we then went to nursing medical school together at Vanderbilt, and then to Boston, where I completed my residency training in medicine and pediatrics. Uh, our dream was to work together in Africa, helping to train African doctors and nurses. And God miraculously provided a job with Cornell Medical College to do exactly that right as I was graduating from residency. We moved to Tennessee in 2007 with two young children, and God soon added three more to our beautiful and chaotic family. We lived in Tennessee for 16 years, helping to start medical school. God taught us so much during those years. God directed our steps back to Fairlawn in the summer of 2023, and we have been attending GRC since our first Sunday in New Jersey. By the grace of God, our kids settled well into local public schools and made friends, and our oldest moved off to Covenant. We were adapting to a new normal and started 2024 with great thanksgiving and anticipation. In mid-January, I returned to Tanzania for two weeks for work and to visit with friends. On February 7th, two weeks after returning, I started having mild abdominal pain together with some cold symptoms. I was otherwise healthy, so I didn't make anything of this. Two days later, the pain became more severe and localized to the right side of my abdomen. My wife had me lay down on the bed, and she felt a mass here in the right upper quadrant. We called a doctor friend at GRC and and went to Valley Hospital where I had a CT scan done. The CT scan showed a 10 centimeter mass the size of a grapefruit here under my liver, which was bleeding into my abdomen. If this had happened two weeks earlier while I was in Tanzania, I likely would have died. 
I was admitted to the hospital overnight at Valley. The following morning, I had an abdominal MRI. Both the CT scan and the MRI indicated that the mass was likely benign. I was discharged home the next day with plans to follow up at Cornell NYP in Manhattan. Uh, and my care was expedited by some colleagues there at Cornell. On February 23rd, two weeks later, I underwent abdom open abdominal surgery. The surgeon removed the mass and removed the right side of my colon and, and sewed me back up. Amazingly, there were no complications whatsoever, and I was discharged home three days later to wait for the results of, of the pathology. On Friday, March 1st, I received the pathology results in my inbox. I went up to my room to read them alone. The mass that we thought was benign was actually a rare and aggressive form of cancer called sarcoma. I was shocked. I was scared. I sat in silence and sadness. Then the words of Jesus from John 16:33 came to mind. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. I was referred to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, MSK, which is just across the road from my office in New York. The sarcoma, the MSK is, has one of the best sarcoma centers in the world. The sarcoma pathologist was able to identify the specific mutation that had caused my cancer, a rare fusion of two genes, which she had just identified in her own laboratory a few years earlier. I met my sarcoma oncologist on March 28th. He told me that I would need further treatment, including chemotherapy. On April 25th, I started chemotherapy. So far, my chemotherapy has been one full day of infusion every three weeks. I have now completed six rounds of chemotherapy. That's the hair. Cancer makes me feel my human weakness in obvious ways. In the weeks after chemotherapy, I feel nauseous and I often have mouth sores that make it hard to eat. I have also had neuropathy and a blood clot in my arm. During these days, I have been greatly encouraged by the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians 7 when he's talking about the treasure that we have of the glory of the good news of Jesus Christ. And he writes, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, struck down, but not destroyed. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The hardest thing about cancer so far has been watching Liz and the kids struggle with this new reality. I am thankful that we have the freedom in Jesus to face the truth about cancer, to speak openly and honestly about how we feel and to mourn together. The Bible is full of honest lament. From Psalms to Job to lamentation, the people of God have always been truthful about the evil in this world. We cry and we even shake our fists at God sometimes. But we can weep without giving in to despair because we know that we worship a God who cares about our suffering. I can tell you that the more bitter the circumstances of life, the more sweet the love of Jesus becomes. Our friend Jesus was the only person in all of history who truly did not deserve any of the suffering and sadness in his life. He suffered it all simply because he loves us. Jesus lived the perfect life that I should have lived, and he died the death that I deserved so that I could receive what he deserves and know that my best days are always ahead of me. Every day I go through cancer treatment, I feel Jesus' presence and love. When I lay awake at night, Jesus is there, and he reminds me that he will one day all undo all of the evil and the sadness and the suffering in the world. He gives my heart hope, courage, and peace, and the strength that I need for every day. The Church of Jesus has supported us every step through this cancer journey. Friends here at GRC, you have brought us meals, you have watched our kids, you have provided rides to chemotherapy, you have prayed for us, you have sent words of encouragement, and you have loved and supported every member of our family. Thank you all. 
Our experience with cancer has been a living testament to what we have been learning together from 1 Corinthians about the body of Christ. Part of God's solution to our suffering is that we should engage in the suffering of of other followers of Jesus. As it says in 1 Corinthians, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member rejoices, all rejoice together. Having cancer is like being on a train to an unknown destination. There are dark tunnels, but also many beautiful vistas. In the same way, our family does not know what lies ahead, but we trust in a God who does know. Abdominal sarcoma is a rare form of cancer, and there are no no set protocols to define the duration of chemotherapy. Instead, I have CT scans every two to three months, and my oncologist adapts the treatment based on the scans. But we are trying not to focus on the CT scans, but rather the joy that is to be found in Jesus every day. Instead of fixating on the darkness as we go through these tunnels, we are learning to live each day in the light of God's love and faithfulness. Of course, we still struggle with fear and doubt and anger, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have learned to rise above our fears. One of our favorite family mottos right now is, don't borrow tomorrow's sorrows. There's treasure to be found on the journey today. So even as we continue to mourn this cancer, we are also finding a lot of joy and laughter as we learn to take ourselves less seriously and take Jesus more seriously. As we learn from our African brothers and sisters, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. No applause for you. No applause. That's okay. No, not whatsoever. God, how is it that you mm-hmm. intend to use a man battling cancer to encourage us to lift up our eyes to know where our help comes from? It comes from you, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so continue to cause the light of Christ to overflow from Rob and the Peck family. Continue to use their faithful following after Jesus to bring conviction to us, to help guide us along the way of discipleship, and certainly to impact others who don't know Jesus savingly, that they might wonder, how is it that this family can so tenaciously cling by faith in the midst of this trial? So cause your word to go forth and not return to your void, Lord. Save, rescue, renew, Mm -hmm. strengthen. Use cancer toward those great and glorious purposes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for letting us in. You know, Rob's, Rob didn't hesitate when I asked him a couple of months ago, and his willingness to share so transparently with us is not driven by some measure of courage. It's certainly not driven by any need for attention. Rob is motivated by longing to glorify and magnify Jesus in and through his life. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, By the way, that's where we'll uh, keep referring back to. If you'd like to follow in your blue uh, Bibles under the chairs in front of you, you can find it on page 937. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15, all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. The all this is Paul's steadfast faith in the midst of suffering, which highlights the heart of the gospel. This paradox that real life comes through dying, and that is only possible because of resurrection power. Rob shared that this chapter especially encouraged him in the days following each chemo cycle. He started with verse 7. I'll read it again. 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. A jar of clay was not precious. It wasn't especially um, strong and long-lasting. It could crack if you dropped it on the floor. It's fragile. Paul then proceeds to describe how difficult his life and ministry have been. And here's his summary, verse 10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What does Paul mean? How does living come from dying? Your greatest problem in life is probably not what you think it is. It's not what keeps you up at night. It's not what worries and distracts you. Your greatest problem in life has nothing to do with big bills or your frustrating career or your conflict-ridden marriage. It is definitely not the futility of your sports teams. Your greatest problem in life, a different way of putting this, The disease that will destroy you is not cancer. It's not heart disease, not Parkinson's, not Crohn's, not diabetes. Your greatest problem, and this is true for every human being who has ever lived uh, in this world except for Jesus, your greatest problem is sin. That disease is 100% terminal apart from the rescuing, intervening grace of God through the Son, Jesus. So the question about any suffering, conflict, struggle is not, this is our instinct, when will it go away? When can I return to some measure of problem-free, obstacle-free living? No, the question about any trial in life is, How can it help you put your own sin to death and instead embrace the life that is only possible through Jesus who died for your sin? How can that suffering redirect your gaze, your hopes, your dreams, your strongest desires away from that which cannot satisfy and will pass away and aim your longings, your hopes upon that which can satisfy and will last forever. An eternal glory, Paul says, that far outweighs every piled up body and soul crushing kind of suffering that this world could ever throw at you. Anytime you catch a glimpse to see more clearly that your true mortal enemy is sin, that is life-giving grace that God has provided in your life. The alternative should scare you because uh, it's so very enticing. The alternative is to live a cancer-free, financially abundant life filled with friendship and adventure and the finest food and drink that don't add a pound to your body and then die like everybody else does and pay your own penalty of spiritual and eternal death that your sins deserve. The alternative is so deadly because it's so very enticing, living in the here and now. Or, second alternative, less bad and maybe more common as I'm talking to church folk, professing faith in Jesus while living for everything else your career, your kid's chance to get into an elite college, the next adventure, the next big purchase, and then, after death, standing before your creator, admitting that during your life you gave glory to everything and everyone else except for Jesus, who alone deserves all praise and all glory. Rob quoted the Apostle Paul, saying, therefore we do not lose heart. But here's what comes first, before, in verse 14. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. 
Paul knows he shall see his creator face to face. That leads to verse 16. Therefore, because of the truth and power of Jesus' resurrection, it is most relevant to life now. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Catch what he says. For our light and momentary troubles, even cancer, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You say, Paul doesn't know what I'm going through. To call my excruciating overwhelming, gut-wrenching, chronic pain, sufferings, conflicts, dead-end situations, to call them light and momentary troubles. Paul doesn't know what I'm going through. But you need to take it up with the spirit who inspired Paul to write these words. God is not cruel. He is the all-wise, all-knowing creator. He sees true good beyond our greatest suffering. And Paul identifies the disconnect. Anytime we have a hard time believing that what we're going through right now are light and momentary troubles, Paul identifies the disconnect. The eyes of our hearts are fixed on what's seen and temporary, which naturally leads to anxiety and all kinds of stress because what we treat as true treasure in life, seen and temporary, is always slipping away from us. It's always breaking down. It's always losing value. Pastor and author John Piper, almost 20 years ago, the day before his cancer surgery, wrote an essay with 10 points called Don't Waste Your Cancer. Uh, There it is. Snap the QR code. If you miss it, uh, just shoot me an email. Um, That tends to get your attention more than an essay Um, as you're looking at your uh, net worth on CNBC called Don't Waste Your Wealth. This guy's about to go into surgery. He doesn't know what the future is going to hold. And he's saying, don't waste your cancer. David Pallison, a biblical counselor, added his own personal thoughts to John Piper's 10 points as David himself was battling cancer. And, And I read this years ago but because now I can connect it to a brother and a friend in real life and talk about it with him in the fellowship hall or in our living rooms, these words hit home a lot more powerfully. And so I, I want to take the time to highlight just a few points. Number three of the 10, Piper's 10. He says, you will waste your cancer if you seek comfort from your odds rather than from God. The aim of God in your cancer, among a thousand other good things, is to knock props, supports, out from under our hearts so that we rely utterly on him. Things we're falsely leaning upon that can't support our lives. The aim of God is to knock those out. This is what Paul said earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. That's not good. But this happened... There's purpose that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Pallison added this, the hymn, be still my soul reckons the odds the right way. We are 100% certain to suffer and Christ is 100% certain to meet us, to come for us, comfort us and restore love's purest joys. The hymn, How Firm a Foundation, reckons the odds the same way. You are 100% certain to pass through grave distresses, and your Savior is 100% certain to be with you, your troubles to bless, and sanctify to you your deepest distress. With God, you are not playing percentages, but living within certainties. Does that preach? Throughout these months, I've heard Rob and Liz say about his cancer prognosis or about some detail of their health journey, we don't know. But I've also heard them clearly affirm, this is what we do know. This is what we stand upon. 
This is what we do know about Christ and his promises. Under number five, Piper writes, cancer does not win if you die. It wins if you fail to cherish Christ. God's design is to wean you off the world and feast you on the sufficiency of Christ. Wow. Rob and Liz have focused this summer on receiving good gifts from God, family, rest, play, adventure, friendship. But that's only been possible in the face of this cancer diagnosis as they've lived out Romans 5 where Paul says suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. How does that work? Suffering has a way of exposing the unsatisfying, enslaving idols that we cherish instead of Christ. It, it pulls back the curtain to, to ask us, what is really important? These things that you give all this attention and energy to and, and your time and your finances to, um, constantly distracting you from that which is important? Or Jesus, who is your life? When those false supports in life are kicked out from under you, the Holy Spirit directs you to lean on Christ alone. What else is there? Who else is there? Jesus, not a, any cure for any disease, is our hope. Final uh, one I'll highlight, number six. Piper writes, you will waste your cancer if you spend too much time reading about cancer and not enough time reading about God. Lighter topics, you could insert, replace, reading about sports, reading about finances, reading about your vacation that you're not taking for another nine or ten months, and not enough time reading about God. David Pallison added this, what's true for your reading is also true for your conversations with others. Other people will often express their care and concern by inquiring about your health. That's good. But the conversation easily gets stuck there. So tell them openly about your sickness, seeking their prayers and counsel. But then change the direction of the conversation by telling them what your God is doing to faithfully sustain you with 10,000 mercies. Robert Murray McShane wisely said, For every one look at your sins, take 10 looks at Christ. What McShane says about our sins, we can also apply to our sufferings. For every one sentence you say to others about your cancer, say 10 sentences are about your God and your hope and what he is teaching you in the small blessings of each day. By the way, can, can I turn that r around and say, yes, ask a person battling cancer about his health about the timing of the next procedure and whether you can bring a meal and how you can pray for him and Liz and the kids. But don't neglect to ask him about his soul. Don't neglect to ask him um, about the, the spiritual and emotional lows and how God might use you to hold him up and encourage him and speak a word. Don't neglect to ask him how his wife and children are doing in keeping their gaze fixed on Jesus. That'll encourage this brother. Regarding the orientation of this um, exhortation, I haven't kept count, but I can tell you that Rob and Liz have very often done this. That's the main reason I've encouraged people to read their CaringBridge site. Yes, to keep up with the procedures and the chemotherapy cycle and the test results so that you can specifically pray, but more importantly, this is the substance. To see this family steadfastly trusting Jesus and praising him still in the midst of the storm. To hear them giving thanks for small things because they recognize these are blessings from their Father in heaven and they will not neglect acknowledging those blessings. I hear them overflowing the word of God sharing this richest treasure of the gospel with others, especially those who don't know Jesus. 
startling them with their um, positivity, with their hope that has not faded, giving to others in their own time of need. This brother and his family have sharpened my faith as I've had the privilege of walking beside them in this struggle. Last thought from their August 5th posting, a few days after the latest scan results were not what they had hoped. 1 Peter 4, the apostle says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. The best is yet to come. Jesus is returning and he will indeed make all things new. Let's pray. Lord, we trust that you've revealed it to us through your word. You've sent followers of Jesus to the sword, to the cross, into disease from which there was no earthly return, whether that's the plague or the flu, as Christians have cared for those in need. It's all sensible through your wisdom because you are the God who raises the dead. Jesus is the first fruits from among the dead. And all of your people who cling by faith to him will follow. Let that resurrection power course through us even now to expose those props, those supports on which we foolishly lean, thinking they can support us, thinking they can bring us happiness, thinking they can fulfill. Lord, don't let us have to have cancer to expose those idols and redirect our gaze, our heart's longings towards Christ to cherish him above all. But if necessary, Lord, yes, use cancer. Use heart disease. Use chronic pain. Use any brokenness because the greater good is for us to see Jesus and to place all of our hope in him and in nothing and no one else. Holy Spirit, use these moments ahead towards that purpose, we ask. Amen.